afternoon and welcome to everybody who's in the room there at the National Press Club and who's joining us online. My name is Paul Conway and I serve as the Chair of Policy and Global Affairs for the American Association of Kidney Patients. And we're very pleased that you're joining us today at this event. My co-moderator, Nick Ulecki from Todd Strategy Group, a bipartisan policy group in Washington, DC, is the co-moderator. You may know him better as one of the policy architects between before the 2019 executive order on advancing American kidney health in the prior administration under Secretary Azar. Uh, Nick has been a very good partner for this event. We'd also like to thank Bear for being a sponsor for today's event. The purpose of this roundtable is very important. We're trying to raise awareness of chronic kidney disease, the latest innovations and treatments, and bring a greater awareness to those who are watching in the media and across the nation as advocates and as professionals who are trying to do more to make certain that patients are treated well and with the latest innovations. The American Association of Kidney Patients is the oldest kidney patient organization and the largest in the United States. We were founded by six kidney patients in 1969 who knew they were undergoing life-saving treatment and thought to themselves, what would this be like for everybody? Not simply to stay alive, but to have the opportunity to continue working and living and pursuing their aspirations. Since that time, our organization has joined many other organizations in the kidney space to fight for several basic things. First is the principle of care choice. Patients should have the right to exercise their choice, not only of the doctor who takes care of them, but also of the advanced medical treatments that keep them alive and best able to pursue work a secure retirement, a home, a family, whatever their aspiration is. And this is very important to us because over the past decade, what we've seen through the hard work of our allies and elected leaders and civil servants and political appointees across many different administrations, what we've seen is a consensus in the United States that change can happen, that we can evolve beyond the status quo of simply having people end up on dialysis with kidney failure. And how has that come about? It's come about by consortiums and collaboratives of well-intended people pushing for innovation to make certain that patients are identified early, that dis disease is detected early, and that the best innovations in America in devices, drugs, and diagnostics are brought forward and into the marketplace so that we don't have to see people assigned to the tragedy of being on dialysis and suffering kidney failure. As much as we can, we need to prevent that. At the American Association of Kidney Patients, we view kidney disease not simply as a healthcare issue, but it is a workforce and healthcare issue, meaning the decisions that a doctor makes, that a regulator makes, and that a payer makes can determine a patient's access to treatments that determine whether they stay in the marketplace, if they stay working, and if they have a career in a secure retirement. That all comes with the package. It's a huge cost to taxpayers, and it's a huge cost to patients and families. And it's very important that working together, government leaders, medical professionals, and patients understand what their choices are and what each one of them has a responsibility to do to bring forward these life-saving treatments for everyone. We appreciate you being with us. So that's the purpose of what we're doing today is that we're educated. And we're very, very pleased to have join us today, panelists that have tremendous expertise, not simply in the field of medicine, but also in the field of government and governance. So let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. We'll have a, a panel of three speakers today. We'll also be joined by one of the top medical experts in kidney disease in the United States. And we'll move through three questions. And then we will have time to dwell on a couple of different questions that have been raised in advance uh, by those who are interested in this roundtable, many of whom are patients. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker or our first panelist. Our first panelist is Dr. Benjamin Bellall, and he currently serves as the Director of Innovation Management in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He was previously the Associate Director of Innovation Policy. Before his work at HHS, Dr. Illoff worked for the Food and Drug Administration. Also joining us is Ms. Kate Blackwell, Deputy Director of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation at the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services. At CMMI, she has served as the Kidney Care Models Lead and is responsible for the CMI, CMMI Kidney Demos. And our final panelist is Dr. Melanie Erguin, 
Assistant Secretary for Legislation at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And before she was on the executive branch side, she was further up Pennsylvania Avenue, working as a senior health policy analyst for the U.S. Government Accountability Office. And she has also had senior positions on the Committee on Ways and Means, earning the title of Deputy Health Staff Director for the committee. Before we move into our roundtable, I'd first like to welcome and introduce a very good friend and ally, and I can't say enough about her, and that's Dr. Susan Quaggan. Uh, Dr. Quaggan is the director of the Feinberg Cardiovascular and Renal Institute and the chief of nephrology and hypertension at the Department of Medicine at Northwestern. But you probably know her better as the president of the American Society of Nephrology, or ASN. And at ASN, under Dr. Quaggan, she has overseen with Todd Ibram and the rest of the staff at ASN some of the best partnerships and collaboratives in the United States in kidney disease. You have the Kidney Health Initiative with the US Food and Drug Administration, and you have the Kidney X Innovation Fund, which is a partnership with HHS and ASN that's bringing so many interesting people and ideas and concepts and plans into the space of kidney disease and fueling the next generation of optimists who can approach this disease who are dedicated to bringing solutions to patients everywhere. But why don't we go ahead and begin on this first pass. And we'll begin with Dr. Quagging doing an overview of chronic kidney disease and the efforts that are underway. Dr. Quagging, go right ahead. Huge thank you to Mr. Paul Conway. Uh, yes, absolutely friend, ally, kidney champion, and really delighted to be a part of this uh, very exciting roundtable today, and also very excited to be uh, joined by such a, an astute group of um, panelists and talking about something that I'm absolutely passionate about, and that is chronic kidney disease, uh, diabetes, and impacting um, what we might do for patients living in the United States. So I was asked to give an overview of uh, chronic kidney disease and diabetes in this country. So I uh, made a few slides. I'm going to go ahead. I can't see them on the monitor in front of me, but now I can. So uh, I think everybody here probably is aware of the huge issue of chronic kidney disease. And if we put numbers on it, around the world there are 850 million people living with kidney disease and 37 million in this country. And that is one in nine Americans living with kidney disease. In addition, one in three or 33% of Americans are at risk of developing kidney disease. But more frightening than those numbers is the fact that 90% of people who are living with kidney disease do not know they have it. It truly is a silent public crisis. And we all know that there's a big expense, along with kidney diseases, over $150 billion spent by Medicare, uh, approximately 7% of the Medicare budget annually. And as uh, Paul mentioned in his, in his beginning, the most important thing is preventing uh, kidney, progression of kidney disease. And not only will that save money, but more importantly, that will save lives. So for a patient who starts on dialysis, it's estimated that uh, their five-year survival is less than 50%. And that prognosis is worse than most cancers. And the horrifying fact is that most patients with advanced chronic kidney disease will never progress to kidney failure because they will die from heart disease or cardiovascular disease, which is accelerated and amplified in the presence of kidney disease. In addition, preventing kidney disease really is a health justice issue. Around the globe, the excess burden of kidney disease occurs in under-resourced and vulnerable populations. And uh, it really is social and political determinants in health that determine who will get kidney disease and who will have access to the best treatments. In this country, if you are black or African American, you are almost four times as likely to develop kidney failure about three times uh, hot more likely to develop it if you are a native Hawaiian or a Pacific Islander, and almost twofold higher in Hispanic, Latinx, and Native Americans. However, if you're white in this country and have kidney failure, you, was, you are twice as likely to receive a kidney transplant, which is the best treatment for kidney failure, than if you are black. 
So preventing kidney disease truly is a health justice issue in this country. And when we think about the silent public health crisis of chronic kidney disease, there is another public health crisis which I think you're all aware of as well, and that is diabetes. So this is an old slide, and in 2015 it was estimated there was over 400 million people worldwide living with diabetes. That number is estimated at 537 million today, and is expected to balloon over 600 million by the year 2040. And Similar to kidney disease, one in two individuals who have diabetes may not be aware that they have it. And in the United States, there are 48 million people roughly living with diabetes. It is the leading cause of kidney disease and kidney failure in this country and around the world. Approximately 50% of all uh, kidney disease is due to diabetes. And if we look at uh, the proportion of individuals with diabetes and think about those huge numbers, approximately 30 to 40 percent of individuals will develop kidney disease if they have diabetes. So these numbers are pretty frightening and you know, should have everybody up in arms trying to increase awareness. However, there are some really fantastic uh, and uh, innovations that have happened that bring, I think, us to a time where there is more hope uh, in this field than we've had, I think, since I've entered the field more than 30 years ago. And uh, over the past number of years, I think beginning in 2015, there's been not one, but a multitude of positive clinical trials. And these clinical trials are so positive, they're I like to say shout from the rooftop types of clinical trials that have incredible power to slow the progression of kidney disease and also to save lives. It began with a group of agents known as SGLT2 inhibitors, or many people call them the Flozins. And these are drugs that do target the kidney and they target a, a transporter that's only found in your kidneys and it makes you spill excess sugar. However, what wasn't expected, it really offloads the kidney, almost lets the kidneys take a holiday. And it's been demonstrated that this truly protects the kidneys. It's a once a day pill. Again, some of my friends like to say it's plug and play. It's very simple and uh, protects not only the kidneys, but also protects the heart. But we've seen additional classes of drugs now. There are the non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, the GLP-1 agonists. So we now have a menu of therapies that have true power and ability uh, to slow the progression of kidney disease and also to protect the heart. And I like to put this in because it's an image that I think really uh, hits home. And this was given to me by a friend uh, of mine, Dr. Adira Levin. She's a nephrologist in Canada, one of the lead authors on some of these trials. And if you look at the pink line, that uh, for a standard patient, an eligible patient for one of these new therapies, the SGLT2 inhibitors, that would be the extrapolated prediction of when their kidneys would fail and they would end up on dialysis. Now look at the blue line. That extends it out 15 years. 15 more years off dialysis is what the prediction is. And I told you at the beginning, if you end up on dialysis, your five-year survival is less than 50%. This really does save lives, gives years back. And I think um, Paul Conway was telling us at the beginning, uh, talking about the workforce. Again, to put it into perspective for someone who may not think about it, someone who's doing in-center dialysis, it's like giving them back three cross-country flights every single week. So incredible, incredible impact. And another good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Kathy Tuttle, uh, who is a global leader in diabetic kidney disease. Uh, she's in Washington State. She's also the chair of the ASN Diabetic Kidney Disease Collaborative. She did some back of the envelope calculations. And if these drugs made it to all eligible patients in the United States, the estimate is that in the first year, 100,000 lives would be saved. And almost 400,000 kidneys would be saved from large progression of kidney disease. So those numbers are amazing. So what do we need to do to accomplish this, to really change those numbers that I shared with you at the beginning? 
I'm an optimist, um, so I don't look at them as challenges. I think about them as opportunities. And one of the most important things, I think you'd agree with me, that we can't impact this disease if we don't first know who has kidney disease. I told you at the beginning that 90% of individuals with kidney disease don't know they have it. In this country, there are no standalone recommendations to screen for kidney disease or to screen for kidney health. The last time USPSTF, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, looked at this was over a decade ago. And they concluded that there was nothing to do early in kidney disease other than treat diabetes or treat the high blood pressure that could impact progression of kidney disease. We now know that is outdated. It is time that they revisit this recommendation. And I would also say, you know, to the individuals who say, well, we need more data before we talk about screening for a disease, why not start screening for kidney health with the added benefit of educating about how important kidneys are? Shouldn't everybody know their kidney number? In addition, it's absolutely critical if we're going to impact those numbers that we have to make these therapies, these incredibly powerful, innovative therapies available to everybody who needs them. And that uh, is going to require a lot of input from a lot of smart uh, individuals. And I will say that right now, some of the biggest challenges to implementing these therapies are the cost of these drugs. So in this country, uh, it can be several hundred dollars out of a patient's pocket uh, to pay for these therapies. In addition, also the um, insurance and the pre-authorization form. So there's a lot of things that we could do to improve it. Our neighbors to the north, these drugs are approximately 80% cheaper in Canada and they are far ahead in implementing these therapies and we should definitely catch up with them. So my final slide is just to emphasize that this really must be a team effort. We heard from Mr. Conway at the beginning, and in the center, patients have to be front and center in this effort. We have to amplify the patient choice and patient voice. They need to have the head seat at the table. In addition, over to my right-hand side, societies such as the American Society of Nephrology are pushing very, very hard to educate our more than 20,000 members around the globe with all sorts of initiatives and all sorts of initiatives with our policy and quality teams to help uh, provide guides or guidance uh, to new policies and legislation that are going to be absolutely essential to move the envelope. Our local institutions, you know, incentives are going to have to align with prevention rather than treating very expensive failure. But if I move over to the left of the slide and why I'm so excited to be here today, we absolutely need partnership with our federal partners um, for surveillance, for screening, for new policies that are going to get these medications to patients. To reinvest in research, it's critically important. We've seen the success now, all these innovations coming. There are more discoveries and we need research in how to implement these treatments as well. Again, just to put it into perspective in this country, NIH spends approximately $400 per cancer patient and $13 per kidney patient. Those numbers have to change. And in addition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, having payers and making sure that these therapies really are easily accessible to patients uh, and are um, cost effective is going to be uh, key. So I'm going to finish there. I would say all my time uh, in nephrology, I don't think uh, the future has been brighter. We have within our grasp the real ability to make a change in the progression of kidney disease. We have the ability to save lives, to save kidneys, but we're going to have to uh, take some action. So with that, I'm going to, to end and again thank uh, Mr. Conway for inviting me. Thank you very much, Dr. Conway. In 2019, the American Association of Kidney Patients declared the decade of the kidney. And the reason why we did that is because we were so very optimistic that change could happen in the next decade and that new therapeutics could come online and new diagnostics. And what you just heard from Dr. Quaggan, who's such a champion and such an optimist, 
is how innovation has entered the marketplace and lives can be saved. Take it from me, a 42 year kidney patient. I spent three years on dialysis and fought every single day to keep working. And I'm 25 years out on a transplant. If you could find a diabetic kidney patient and give them a therapy that extended their time with their family and in their workforce and building retirement security another 15 years, you'd have to ask yourself, why aren't we doing that? And can we do better? And the fact is we can, and we can do better because we have champions like Dr. Quaggan out there in the American Society of Nephrology who are working diligently to educate not just doctors, but elected leaders and government leaders in so many other sectors that this is the right thing to do and this is the right time to do it. Research and innovation is entering the marketplace and we should take joy in that because it's a huge victory for society and for patients. Thank you again, Dr. Quaggan, you're a real champion. Now what I'd like to do is go ahead and move to the first discussion question of the round table. The first question is, what is the ongoing HHS effort to address chronic kidney disease awareness and diagnosis and how are stakeholders, especially patients being engaged? What specific initiatives are focused on stopping progression, especially among vulnerable populations? And what are the planned next steps CMS is taking to address chronic kidney disease? And what I'd like to do is go ahead and have Dr. Eloff start, and then uh, Dr. Pickerin, and then Ms. Blackwell can follow. Thank you. Go right ahead. I'd like to uh, thank you, Paul and, and Nick, for the invitation to uh, uh, represent uh, HHS and, and OASH and our innovation uh, and, and partnership uh, with ASN, uh, the Kidney X program. Um, I think you mentioned at, in your opening remarks uh, how uh, uh, instrumental Nick was in uh, starting off at, uh, the, the executive order and uh, Kidney X, um, and it's really been a pleasure to uh, uh, help manage that program and bring innovation into kidney care and, and treatment for uh, end-stage renal disease. Um, first, as, as all uh, federal employees have to do, I'm going to give my, my disclaimer. Um, everything that I, I say is my opinion, um, not that of the, the department. Um, unless something sounds really good and the department wants to take it up, then it's the department's opinion. Um, but in, in seriousness, um, in terms of, of CKD awareness, uh, I think uh, what we just heard from Dr. Quaggan is absolutely correct. Um, and we were just speaking about this before uh, getting on camera. It's critically important that each American be as aware of their kidney disease stat or kidney function status as they are of their cholesterol level and their blood pressure. But how do we get there? We get there by bringing that into primary education uh, and, and outreach. What we're really good at as a society, as scientists, as academic doctors, is doing research and figuring it out. Um, there's loads and loads of, of academic publications that tell us what we need to do to prevent, what actions people can take, what screening can be done. Um, what we do poorly is communicate that to the lay audience in any disease. You name the disease, we do a really, really poor job as a medical community in bringing people forward and explaining why someone's health is, and monitoring their health is so important to especially uh, our, our youngsters uh, that we deal with. Um, and, and, you know, those, uh, uh, those who are, are the invulnerable 20-year-olds, uh, for example, um, and if we can reach out to them and at even younger ages and get them to understand what kidney health is, we can actually save the lives that Dr. Quaggan was talking about. 
So what are we doing? Um, as part of the Kidney X initiative, uh, it's mostly been focused on developing a new artificial kidney. Um, and, and we're proud to be moving forward on all fronts with that. Um, but we are also investigating right now ways to uh, uh, engage the public, people with kidney disease. I don't like the word patient because patient is very reductive. It takes a person and reduces them to their disease. People who have other expertise, who have a passion for, for working and caring for other people like them. We're looking to engage those people to help us understand what it is we need to do and come up with those great ideas because if we keep doing what we've been doing, we will keep failing to present a, uh, a prevent kidney disease. I'm gonna go right over, over to you, doctor. Um, I am going to share with my colleagues my thanks for letting us join you, letting me join you today. Um, same disclaimer, these are my thoughts. They are not thoughts of the department. Um, I always like to say I love my job. I want them to let me back into the Humphrey building and um, continue to serve the American people. So these are um, my thoughts. And I like, I like adding yours of like, if they're really brilliant, then anybody else can have them. I'm going to start adopting that into my spiel. Um, I'm also going to preemptively apologize for needing to step out for a little bit. Um, one of the challenges of my job is my schedule is not my own. So I'm very happy that I get to spend this time with you. Um, but I will step out and, and then I will come back and happy to answer questions. I think the part of like where do I sort of fit into the equation um, at HHS is actually how does the Hill and how do members of Congress advocate on behalf of their constituents? and advance the health objectives of legislation, and then what does that mean in terms of its, our engagement um, with the Hill, with patients, and then as a department. And it's a kind of unique space to sit. So it is exciting, and it was exciting to be at the executive order signing um, under the last administration. It is more exciting for me to sit into the briefings and hear what we are doing and hear as people really ask questions around equity and access and thinking about what is the next steps and how do we do this, but also talking with members of Congress as you and various patients come before them and talk to them about a lived experience. Um, it's always interesting to hear people talk about sort of the invincible 22-year-old or 23-year-old um, because I think the stories that we hear that really drive the legislation and those policy changes are not the people that sort of slowly moved into um, kidney failure, but it's the people that show up that are perfectly healthy. And you have all, right, either you are this patient or you know this patient, you love this patient, you care for this patient. And I am going to use patient because it really is a disease experience at this point where they show up and they are all of a sudden really sick and there's no reason it's a healthy 23-year-old right, is now in your emergency room. Um, that's one of the statistics you didn't bring forward, right, which is the number of patients that are diagnosed basically like crashing into the emergency room. From a federal perspective, how do you prevent that? How do you prevent, you focus on knowledge? So my role is really, before it ever gets to CMMI or before it gets to the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, it's really, what are the policies that we are hearing? How do we work in collaboration um, with one of the other branches of government to make sure that there's an understanding and an advocacy um, and an engagement to make our population healthier. So I think always what I say is, you know, come talk to us, but also talk to your, talk to the patients, talk or talk to your um, members of Congress, your senators, their local staff, and share stories, share innovations, talk to them about why this is important because they are hearing from so many people but when they hear that and they bring that forward, it really does force us to be better at our jobs. I shouldn't say that. Yeah, it does. It forces us to be better at our jobs and be able to explain it. Great. Well, I will echo the thanks of my fellow panel members for having us here today. Um, and I will also echo the disclaimer. Um, my opinions are my own. I will add the caveat, though, if my opinions are brilliant, I would like a footnote when the department uses them um, to get credit for that. 
Um, so I'm here representing CMS and particularly the CMS Innovation Center. For those of you not familiar with the Innovation Center, uh, we are charged under the Affordable Care Act with testing alternative ways of paying for Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP services to improve quality and reduce cost. Um, and the CKD population is sort of a perfect area where there is need and opportunity for improved Medicare payment policy. Um, while payment policy is sort of the last step in the innovation process, researchers do research, then they make recommendations, those recommendations are shaped into policy, and then CMS figures out how to pay for them. Um, and so taking that quotidian day-to-day, -day, how are we going to pay doctors, hospitals, dialysis facilities to care for their patients, is the last step in the process, but it's also the step that perhaps touches the most lives, or at least the most Medicare patients, um, or Medicare enrollees, I should say, um, since they're the ones going to their doctor's office receiving care that is shaped by the incentives that we create through what we pay for. Um, one of the really exciting things happening in Medicare payment and in Medicare payment innovation at the moment is the transition from fee-for-service to a more value-based care or accountable care environment. Um, so instead of worrying about individual reimbursement, the hope is that we are freeing up healthcare professionals to focus on the needs of their patients by focusing less on individual services and more focusing on things that are better for their individual patients, better for prevention, better for long-term health, better at producing health outcomes um, than just producing units of medical care. And CKD fits exactly in that framework. Um, if a, you know, you go to your primary care physician and they are now incentivized to manage your long-term progressive disease, um, CKD is right there. They should be testing to make sure that people are aware of their kidney disease status. And if they start down the path for CKD, they're then incentivized to prevent progression because we all know that a patient receiving dialysis costs more than a patient earlier in the CKD process. Um, so by delaying or preventing progression to CKD, not only does the healthcare system and therefore the taxpayer save money, but also the patient's life improves, right? They don't have to be a dialysis patient. They can be a person with CKD who is managing their condition in the longer term. Um, so I think many of the efforts coming out of CMS and of CMMI um, specifically are focused on this transition and there's really an opportunity for CKD care to fit in that framework. Great. Thank you each very much. And Dr. Corgan, I'd like to give you the opportunity to comment on any of the presentations that you just heard here. Sure. Thank you, um, Paul. I think all terrific. And, um, you know, actually, I'm going to follow up on the, the most recent one with the incentives and um, agree that moving upstream to, you know, prevent prevention and primary care um, is going to be really important. Is there an opportunity and how can we sort of transform the CKD field like was done for HIV or even during the COVID pandemic? Because I would say that, you know, we, we have an opportunity here with these new therapies, really incredible um, opportunity, um, sort of beyond what a lot of other advances that happen in fields. Um, and so I'm not sure you can comment on that, but you know, I think about how HIV care was transformed in this country and how the drugs were paid for, and you know, it really made a huge impact. I think we have that opportunity in CKD, um, and how do we get that to happen? Sure. Um, I would say that part of CMS's current strategy, one of the pillars of our new strategic direction, is ensuring that patients have access to new innovative technologies, therapies, whatever they may be. Um, and so that is certainly a priority of the administration of CMS and of CMMI. Um, I will also say that under a value-based framework, if there are new therapies that are effective and cost-effective and work well for patients, the sort of concern about cost is a little bit ameliorated, right? Because we are looking at a higher level um, expenditure or a longer term um, expenditure framework, right? So we're thinking about what is this doing at a population level for a particular set of providers? Um, 
in terms of managing beneficiary expenditures. So if we're looking at a five-year time horizon, something that costs a little bit more upfront but can delay progression so that we cost a little bit less on the dialysis side, right, that all fits into that framework and there's opportunities there to incorporate new and innovative therapies. Okay, terrific, thanks. And maybe just um, about the screening because this is something I'm also passionate about and, you know, again, looking at examples that have worked in other places and it really requires, again, sort of being patient-driven and community-focused. So, you know, I look to an example, again, I, you might see I, I'm a Canadian, so I, I know a lot about the Canadian system. But in the First Nations um, population, they started a CKD, it's a kidney health check, and it's point of care, um, real time analysis of kidney function, blood pressure, screening for diabetes. Again, it's an at risk community, but it was developed in partnership with the elders of the community and really focused on their beliefs being central. Um, you know, I think about screening in, in this country, and it'd be great to educate people early on, but honestly, people aren't getting screened. They're not, you know, unless you happen to be wealthy in this country and have, you know, all sorts of preventive care, but it's, it's really the at-risk populations that aren't getting access to this. So how, how, how do we get there in this country? So. I'll take a quick stab, and then if any of my co-panelists want to jump in, that's a really big question. Yeah. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of things. Because, and this is preempting our next question on challenges, but we'll go there anyway. Uh, because Medicare only covers patients who are 65 or older or otherwise eligible, right, CKD affects the entire population, not just the aged and disabled population. And so any effort to increase awareness, increase screening, needs to work in conjunction with CMS and all other payers, since we only have a portion of um, the lives of people who might be experiencing CKD. So that really has to be a partnership. It also has to be driven by the community of physicians and community health centers and hospitals who are doing this work. Um, and I think that goes well with the accountable care framework I've been mentioning, right? Like if it is beneficial for your primary care ACO practice to go out into the community and screen, they're incentivized to go out into the community and screen, and we've made that possible for them in an accountable care framework. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Coggin. And not to put too fine a point on this issue of screening, but I wanted to raise this. When I was 16 years old, I had a sports physical. Um, and the reason why I had this sports physical and why I was pursuing sports in high school is I wanted to go to a service academy. And it just turned out that my doctor... Uh, here on the coast of Maine in a town of 6,000 people, happened to be a retired RAF flight surgeon who had come to the United States in the 1960s for the Apollo program. And as a standard practice, he screened for kidney issues because that was his tradition in the military and for NASA. And he's the one that detected that I had kidney disease. And what it did is it allowed me to work forward for the next 13 years as a CKD patient but I understood what was coming. Had I not had that opportunity and that rare instance, because it was not common, uh, I would have been one of those invincibles that found out how sick he was uh, through an emergency room. There are some estimates that for that population, for those who end up on dialysis, almost 50% come through the emergency room. And this is why it's so incredibly important to have champions like Dr. Quaggan and ASN driving this issue of early screening for kidney health, because it really does make a huge difference in terms of being able to work ahead of the curve and not have a devastating impact through kidney failure on yourself and your family. It is just tragic, the stories we hear at AAKP. And we're working very hard with all of our allies to try to reverse that. So thank you very much, Dr. Quaggan, for raising that. It's a key point. Now what I'd like to do for question two is uh, turn over to uh, my friend and good colleague, uh, Nick Ulecki. And uh, Nick, why don't you go ahead and take it away? 
Sure, thanks, Paul. And again, uh, so thankful for the panelists uh, to be here and, and all the, the work that, that we've all done together in the past. I'll tell you, one of my deepest regrets is not including a, a national CKD awareness or national CKD screening awareness day uh, in, in the work that we did. Uh, but you know, I think that's something that we can all aspire to at some point. Um, because remember, I mean, just 25 years ago, um, Mammography screening was, you know, not as high as it is today, and now hundreds of fully grown men wear pink for a month uh, in the NFL um, as a sponsor to to that to such a screening, and I think that's that's quite a possibility there. So just not to not to slam the point home on screening, but um, okay. Um, so question two is, how can better systemic structures be created so patients are not forced to advocate for appropriate care at every point in their care journey? What actions is CMS or HHS taking to close these equity gaps uh, in CKD related to treatment access, and, and what do you see as the major barriers to care in this area in, in your roles? Um, I think, uh, why don't we start with uh, Dr. Gorin and then move on down in the other direction. Sorry, I want to make sure. So I think it's been interesting because we did sort of start this conversation of where the systemic Barriers. And I think one of the places we've looked at is the multiple player payers and the multiple touches. Um, as many of you know, one of the unique things about end-stage renal disease is it's actually something that entitles you to Medicare. It is one of the few diseases that creates automatic in entitlement. Um, and so it creates weird economic incentives for early screening, especially within other public payers. And when we think about the cost of pharmaceuticals and treatments, it really sometimes isn't patient forward. And I think sometimes that thinking about how do you make sure that our payment structures and our way of thinking of somebody's whole health from very much from birth until decisions are made at the end should be brought into it. I will say from a departmental perspective, equity, addressing equity gaps and really talking about them and making them part of any policy conversation is a key priority of Secretary Becerra. It is one of the th questions he asks at every policy briefing, regardless of issue, is how does this look across our populations? How does this address equity and equality and access? Um, so how do you talk about being an advocate for yourself? I think that's unfortunately part of our healthcare system, whether you're wearing pink and talking about breast cancer through the month of October, um, or any other disease, it really is a level of patient engagement. It is a level of patient, you know, I mean, I always think about patients that come in and used to come to visit me when I was working in Congress with their file folder, and they're like, these are my medical records, please help me, right? And it was a binder that was three inches thick, and there was a good shot that their mother was also carrying a binder that was three inches thick, just so they could coordinate their care. So I think it's not unique to a CKD population. I think the advocacy, the ultimate goal is to see that mitigated, to see systems, to see societies working, not just in like, this is where we are as ASN, but like, this is where we work with the primary cares, with family physicians, with all of the other places to create that harmony. Um, and I think the equity question is a question we should just continue to ask. I wish I, I mean, right, if I had a solution, I could pull it out of the air. One, it would make my heart so happy because it's what I've spent my career doing, but I think it would also solve a lot of the challenges we see throughout our healthcare system. And one of the things that Dr. Quinn said was only the really wealthy people get preventive care. And like, we sh that, is a, I mean, that is a heartbreaking statement to hear where I, where I sit, right, at that unique intersection because that is the point of the USPSTF. That is the point of so many policies that have been passed by Congress to really think about preventive care, and we're still not there. Um, but it shouldn't be that, right? It should be this lens and this access. It should not be what prevents people from getting what they need. Um, I think in terms of specific CMS, HHS initiatives, I'm gonna leave it to my colleagues. Great. Um, and just as the secretary is consistently asking about equity at every briefing, so too is Administrator LeSure. Um, CMS and CMMI are committed to equity in a way that is so exciting to see and so excited to be a part of now. Uh, so uh, as I alluded to before, CMS only has access or has policy control over payment for 
patients who have Medicare as their primary or secondary payer, and to an extent Medicaid patients and CHIP patients as well, although hopefully not too many CHIP patients are in this population. Um, that is one of the key sort of structural barriers to CMS being able to disseminate change in this area, right? ESRD, we ran um, an innovative payment model um, related to ESRD care um, that came to a close in the middle of last year. We were able to make changes to payment that were effective at um, improving quality, reducing cost. Um, but we did that for ESRD patients for a reason, because we are the predominant payer for ESRD patients. Um, we are not the predominant payer for CKD patients, and so moving upstream to CKD in a subsequent model presents a lot of challenges for us. Um, and those challenges tie to who is getting screened, who is getting preventive care, who is getting education related to their kidney disease. It's a subset of the population under Medicare's control who are 65 or older or otherwise eligible for Medicare. Um, and the additional equity complication on that, right, is patients who are gaining Medicare eligibility, <clears throat> excuse me, because they have landed on dialysis are more likely to be from socioeconomically disadvantaged populations. And so they come in to Medicare sicker, uh, less educated about their condition, less ready for dialysis, um, and therefore have worse outcomes than other patients who have access to preventive care before they get to Medicare. Um, and so that's a thing that is consistently on our minds at CMS um, about how to look upstream to those patients that we're not necessarily getting to to make sure that when they do hit Medicare, they're doing a good job, um, or that Medicare is well positioned to take care of those patients. Um, so while we are working very hard to address health equity for the patients that belong to CMS, um, there, there is, of course, much to be done across payers with Medicaid, with private payers, to think about those challenges and how we can all sort of work together and pull together in the same direction to improve outcomes for these patients. So I, I'm going to start again with a, a disclaimer. Uh, the CMS aspect of, of this question, uh, I am in no way whatsoever qualified to address. Um, and so I'm going to stay away from that. Um, but I do, I do want to talk about the, the department uh, writ large and uh, uh, kidney X. Um, you know, when, when y y you get to, as uh, uh, the assistant secretary mentioned a moment ago, uh, any, any disease, any, any patient, especially chronic diseases, um, the people with those diseases need to advocate for their own care. Um, and what we're seeing as in just the last decade or so are more patient advocates at the individual hospital and those care teams be developing around certain diseases. Um, you're seeing this in, in cardiology a lot where there's a care team. So when you get to being diagnosed with the disease, being in, in the treatment system, um, we are seeing models develop um, that are, are good practices for that and whatever we can do legislatively from a policy standpoint to move those forward is, is fantastic. Um, but I, I want to uh, follow up on something I, I said before, um, which is we as a, a, as a medical uh, elite group of scientists and policymakers and thinkers and all of that do a terrible job of, of communicating. Um, we do an even worse job of communicating how important uh, prevention is and getting that into especially the, the uh, populations that need to understand and act on preventative measures. Um, and again, Part of, of why we're, we're going forward with the crowdsourcing models, part of what drew me into our innovation programs is empowering 
the populations at risk, reaching out to them directly and saying, how can we help you address these challenges? How can we, how can we better speak to you? How can we get you to advocate? How can we help you advocate um, for your individual health, your population health? Um, switching gears for a second, um, I'd like to talk about the uh, uh, health equity aspects of uh, end-stage renal disease. Um, Dr. Quaggan mentioned that the best therapy is a transplant, and um, we, we white people are able to get them at twice the rate of anyone else. Still a very low number are able to get them, but hey, we're doing great, which is terrible, absolutely terrible and unacceptable. The development of an artificial kidney would be absolutely colorblind. The development of this artificial kidney that, that we're working towards and have been for several years will help get some sort of, of therapy for these end-stage renal disease uh, 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 people who are in need of kidney transplant. Um, and it will be regardless of their uh, uh, demographics. Um, and, and hopefully we can work with CMS once it gets further into the clinical trial stages uh, and eventually on, on the market to work towards a, a payment model. Um, one thing I, I think that was in the, the pre-brief, uh, there was a, a question about incentivizing uh, uh, care. Um, maybe that's can get to later. But I wanted to bring up a couple of back of the envelope numbers. Um, so 2019 numbers from uh, uh, the CDC showed that the United States CMS pays about $37 billion on end-stage renal disease every year. So in 2019, $39 billion was the entire budget of the NIH. Also that year, um, $37.9 billion was the combined budget of the EPA, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. If we could touch just a little bit of that in prevention, in bringing up better treatments, think of what we could do as a society. For a few minutes here and a few minutes, Dr. Gordon, I, I was really glad that you brought up uh, economics um, and, and the value economics here um, when you talk about prevention, particularly because um, I had expected your answer to, to barriers was just going to be the Congressional Budget Office. Um, but no, it, it's, you know, and, and I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Gorin on a CKD model before we sort of crashed and burned and, and, and went, went on to work on something else because it was very difficult. And I know I have to shout out to Kate. I know how much you love when Congress meddles in your, in your affairs. Um, but, you know, I think I'd be interested to know if, you know, when, when you all say advocate, I also hear educate, um, particularly with all the turnover on the Hill. Um, Dr. Gordon, can you just talk a little bit more to the benefit of patient groups getting up there and getting in front of what are very young people and who may not really be aware of this that are actually helping, you know, potentially write some of these new laws or, or maybe even give Kate some more flexibility so that we can, we don't have to run into some of these issues. Okay, so now I'm going to take off my hat in my current space. I'm supposed to talk about HHS. In my prior life, um, where I sat in a room with really, really smart, really committed people trying to solve all of the Medicare, ACA, health tax woes, and worked with my colleagues to solve all of the public health problems. I think what people don't realize is how small, how smart, but also how um, pulled in many directions congressional staff are. So the, I will give an example, the Ways and Means staff, which has jurisdiction in healthcare over all of Medicare, 
had three in the minority, three staff. The Democratic majority staff right now has five people. Um, I used to joke Nick and I were in charge of MA, and that's 1% of the gross domestic product. There were the two of us and our two counterparts at Energy and Commerce and two people at Senate Finance. Um, we are very smart. I'm not saying we aren't, but right, like it becomes where, how do you crowdsource knowledge? How do you bring people, their stories, their experience there? And how do you look as a congressional staffer to the multitude of voices. And I think that's something that people don't understand. And if you are in DC, you often hear about lobbyists. I will tell you the story of the best lobbyist that I ever talked to in my decade on the Hill was a 14-year-old boy who with a chronic condition who came and he was like, this is what it means for me. This is what it means for my family. This is what it means for my girlfriend. This is right then we were like, okay, like that is a real lived experience of somebody who wasn't a patient, right? They were a whole person and it was presented in a way. Um, he's graduating from high school this year. This is like, we've stayed in touch because he was, he explained a disease state, not about the disease and the science, but really about what does it mean. Um, the thing to know in most congressional, so, right, the thing to know about most congressional offices is the person that's doing health care, whether in the House or the Senate, is probably also doing at least four other things. It may be education, it may be the Veterans Administration, it may be labor. I did tax policy as well as doing health care policy, um, even at a pretty senior level. So I think it's knowing they are being pulled and being able to share the th share not just stories, but concrete information of what is that lived experience. Because that is why every member of Congress has a certificate of election that hangs on the door. It's why everybody work who works for them, right? It is to help constituents. It is to make, there may not be agreement. And I know that like in the news, there's all this splashy like, watch as Chuck bombs at each other, metaphorically. Um, but in reality, if you choose to be a healthcare staffer, whether that is your career or that is something you do for six months till somebody picks up the portfolio, it is there to make the services better, the healthcare experience better, the community better. I will say not everybody agrees on what that pathway is, but the goal of public service, the goal of what should legislation do, what should policy do, it should drive to a better system I often hope, and I read enough policy to say, most people believed as they were working with communities, with their bosses, that it was the right answer, even if it, other people would say it wasn't. So I think that's part of the importance. Um, and sharing, and it also like sharing that individual experience and then drawing it back. This is what it means to me. This is what it means to the community. This is what it means for the millions of Americans with chronic kidney disease. Each step back in strengthens the impact of what you're talking about. Um, but also recognize those people are probably doing 97 things, so please send them the material in advance. This is like not to be, not, and don't just read off of it, share the story. Um, so. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Dr. Buck, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to our panelists' responses to that second question as well. Nick, um, really fantastic discussion and, um, you know, just following up on a couple, actually the lived experience, and I know um, Paul can talk to this because it was a patient through AAKP, I believe, you know, 50 years ago, October 30th, we're going to be celebrating the Medicare entitlement for dialysis, and it really was a patient story um, that, that meant all the difference. Um, the other point that our colleague brought up was about collaborations, and I, I would like to say on behalf of ASN that you know we are incredibly grateful for the collaborations that we have with um, government agencies, certainly AAKP, and and the one of the things that we've launched to try to improve, um, advance um, getting these therapies to patients is a diabetic kidney disease collaborative I mentioned earlier, that Kathy Tuttle chairs now. And we, you know, prior to COVID, we had some in-person and then we had some virtual 
gatherings of multiple stakeholders. We have patients on that panel who are absolutely critical to drive um, our, our mission and our vision and, and, and our activities. Um, we've had uh, wonderful engagement from um, you know, government leaders and um, patient organizations, NKF. I think it's preventive care, primary care, cardiologists. It really is going to um, require this very collaborative team effort to move things forward. Um, which I agree with. Um, so I think Nick. No, thank, thank you very much. Um, it's it's definitely going to it's definitely going to take a group effort on this. Um, you know, particularly as we come out of COVID. Um, and I did want to just just quickly ask. Um, you know, I, more maybe rhetorically, but hopefully uh, inside of the department because I doubt you can share anything on it. But understanding COVID and, and long COVID to be this mystery darkness ahead and, and being largely a vascular disease. You know, we can only imagine how many of our patients that don't know that they have kidney disease became significantly worse uh, during that time. So, so I'd hope, I don't know if you want to touch on it, but I, I, hope, I hope that's an issue that, that you all are looking at as well. Uh, I'll take part of this one. Um, it, you know, when the, the pandemic first hit um, and I, I was, just changing jobs in, into uh, taking over part of the kidney X portfolio. And uh, one of the very first things that I, I did, Nick called me up and, and put me on a, a, a panel to work with um, ASN to address the, uh, some, some important policies regarding uh, access to kidney care uh, during the early stages of, of the pandemic. You know, we knew right from the, the get-go that there was a, a large overlap in uh, uh, COVID and the sequelae to uh, uh, the kidney, uh, both for existing um, CKD, uh, uh, people with CKD, and for uh, 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 new cases or exacerbations. Um, so uh, our, our group is also working um, on, on long COVID and um, what uh, my office in, in particular is, is interested in is again, the human side of long COVID and understanding what the patient experience is. Um, we've uh, uh, issued a few uh, 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 reports of our Health Plus model, um, uh, uh, most recently in August, uh, that that talk about uh, uh, long COVID uh, overall, uh, not specific to kidney, um, and and we are looking to follow that up and really understand what the patient experience is. Um, no, I did it. I said patient, but it is. People uh, uh, living with with uh, long COVID and and how it affects uh, 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 kidney disease. So yes, we're paying attention to it, um, and more than that, we're we're actively not just listening but seeking out those experiences so that we can hear, understand, and. Uh, really shape how how care is, is uh, delivered and what care is needed. Um, in in the introduction, I uh, said that I worked at, at FDA for some years um, in a variety of different things. I I love approving the next awesome thing and working on. The artificial kidney is great. I really want that thing. I'm an engineer. I love gizmos, all of that sort of stuff. Um, prevention, I, I'd much rather have prevention that reduces the need for those gizmos, first of all. Um, but secondly, you can make all of these wonderful things uh, all you want and have awesome ways to pay for them that, that makes it affordable. Uh, but none of that is useful if you can't get people to use them. Thank you. Um, 
I think with that, I will turn back uh, over to Paul uh, for the third question. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. Those are great responses. Um, so now with the uh, last uh, discussion question for today um, for the panelists, uh, what actions has the department undertaken to ensure that the right therapies get to the right patients at the right time? And what are the key barriers to treatment access that you see? And how might CMS identify appropriate areas to focus on and measure that will move the needle effectively in terms of improved outcomes and lower long-term costs to patients, families, and taxpayers. And uh, why don't we go ahead and start with uh, uh, CMS and then uh, Dr. Ella, if you want to answer. Great, well, I'm gonna jump to my favorite part of this question, um, which is about what are we measuring? Um, there's somewhere a quote in the ephemera about you know you, what you measure is what you get results on. And so the things that we're measuring are the places where there's data, where we can observe what's happening, and we can observe change over time, and also perhaps pay for change over time um, if we're measuring the right things and people are making progress. Um, I mentioned that we have some kidney payment models at the Innovation Center. One of the models that we're currently running, the Kidney Care Choices model, is a model that's an ACO style model introducing accountable care for patients with late stage CKD and stage renal disease and who've received kidney transplants. And perhaps the coolest thing that we're doing that isn't changing the way Medicare pays for kidney care uh, is we're developing a quality measure for delaying progression of CKD. Um, many people have told us it could not be done. Uh, in the spirit of innovation, uh, we decided to charge forward anyway, and it looks like we are well on the path to developing a quality measure that will be claims-based, um, so no additional burden to providers or participants to report information that will be able to measure whether or not individual or group practices are delaying progression of CKD. Um, I'm so excited about this, it's sort of nerdy. Um, if we can measure that a patient, the, a group of patients is progressing from CKD to ESRD at a lower rate, then we can identify who's doing a good job delaying and preventing progression, and we can disseminate those best practices. If that's a really great therapy that's being used broadly, that's fantastic. If that's early intervention, community outreach, education, like let's figure out the thing that can work for this outcome that we really care about and let's disseminate it. Um, so that's, that's the thing that we are working to measure um, and we're really excited about, obviously. Um, other things that we'd like to focus on to move um, the needle in terms of progression um, and delay, I think one of the one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about and is less obvious is um, whether or not we should be measuring incidence of education. Um, one of the really easy things to do when you're developing a quality measure is make a measure that's did thing X happen, yes or no, a process measure. So did your doctor talk to you about CKD? Um, it's important for doctors to talk to their patients about CKD, but that doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the education being delivered. If the conversation is, hey, I ran your lab values and you need to look at your EGFR next year, um, that's, not, that's not meaningful education. That's not going to help that person understand their disease. It's not going to help them understand that they might be on the path to needing dialysis someday, and so they might need to take some actions to ameliorate that path. Um, but how do we measure the quality of the education without having someone sitting in the doctor's office with them while that education is being delivered? So that's a, a thing that we're grappling with continuously. Education is so important, particularly for a place where we're trying to delay progression of a chronic progressive disease, um, but getting the measurement right and therefore having a thing that we could tie to payment to create incentives or publish so that patients know which doctors are good at delivering education, right? Like that's a harder bar and requires significant collaboration with our patient and provider partners so that we're getting something that's meaningful and useful for everyone. 
So again, uh, um, I, I will say that the CMS aspect of this is uh, way, way outside of, of uh, anything I know about. I would like to nerd out with uh, uh, Kate on, on the um, uh, the prevention measure, uh, uh, with quality measures. Um, and actually that speaks to something I, I love about innovation. Um, and and what, I, what I tell those in our group is um, don't let the people who tell you it can't be done get in the way of the people doing it. Uh, and so really hats off to you uh, uh, for doing it. Um, in terms of uh, uh, what actions have, have we taken um, to ensure the right therapies get to the right patients, um, less on a policy that, uh, uh, measure, but more on, again, the people measure, it's the collaborations uh, and, and uh, uh, consortia like the uh, uh, Kidney Health Initiative um, like Kidney X, um, because hidden in the question, what is the, the right therapy? What is the right therapy? How do we define that? Do I, do I go to my other friends in academic medicine, my biomedical engineers who I uh, think of, of the kidney in a glass box and you know can measure all of the, the neat things that each of the tubules do and, and so on, uh, and have them tell me about what the right therapy is? Um, or do I go to the population who needs these therapies, the actual people, and what do they need? What do all of you need? And so that's the question that we're trying to answer. We've got lots of cool therapies. We've got new ones on the way. We've got research happening. We need more research, yes. Um, but the first part is identifying what are the actual needs. Great, and uh, Dr. Quaggan, would you like to weigh in? And what you've just heard here. Yeah, sure. No, and I, I'm glad you used the word nerd because that's how nephrologists see themselves in a very good way. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, you know, anything that can make these therapies and bring prevention to everybody um, equally and access to all is absolutely what we want. So I guess one question, and, and you know, it would be great... Um, to know from from both um, panelists, you know what what can ASN do? What can nephrologists do to help, um, you know, advance that? So one of the issues is a lot of patients don't get to the healthcare system. Period. And so we heard about crash starts on dialysis in the emergency room, and um, you know every week I'm on service. It's heartbreaking. There'll be um, a young 30 or 40 year old individual who you know, never knew they had kidney disease, crashes in with a hypertensive emergency and needs to initiate dialysis. So we're not, get, we're not getting to them early enough. Um, and then for the quality measure, which I think is fantastic, we all want to reduce progression. Somehow it's going to have to come along with making these drugs accessible so that the patients can, you know, get them. They don't have to pay out of pocket so that physicians aren't you know, try struggling with the insurance forms and getting them sent back and trying. So there's a, so many different things um, that have to come into play. But certainly, um, yeah, so I'd be interested if there's anything you see us, you know, being able to do that would help to, you know, facilitate that or... So I'll, I'll say one thing, which is a thing that we at CMMI sort of are constantly struggling with and that I think you guys could be great partners on, is breaking down silos in medicine. So, you know, a thing we often hear when we're talking to patients who are on dialysis, who've crashed into dialysis, um, not only did they not know, but they were seeing a primary care provider before crashing into dialysis. Um, and the nephrologist then says, well, what, they weren't my patient. Not 
because, not because they were being irresponsible, because there wasn't that connection between primary care and specialty care. And that's not unique to nephrology, right? Like primary care and specialty care are different things. They have different incentive structures, they have different reimbursement structures, and so they behave differently. Um, and so I think a thing that we would like to know how to be better partners on um, is how to help facilitate um, the relationship between primary care and specialty care. Um, a thing we hear a lot about is data sharing, um, and so we're you know, always working to free the data or release data so that it can be better used, working, of course, within the, the bounds of HIPAA and other legal constraints. Um, but anywhere that you know, specialty providers see barriers to coordinating with primary care, that's a thing we're certainly interested in hearing more about, how we can, how we can help. point too, I think, and all the discussion we've had about screening, since there are no current standalone recommendations to screen the primary care, physicians already have a, a huge number of guidelines they have to go through. So um, it would be really, really valuable. I think that's one thing that might help to sort of catalyze some of the change. Um, but agree with you 100% that, yeah, silos can't exist in medicine. And, Thank you, Dr. Corbin. And one quick question that I have um, for CMS. In the development of that measure, do you plan to have uh, technical evaluation panels? That's one thing that I know that the professional societies and patient advocates have benefited from over the past seven years on measure developments, especially um, in the areas of um, patient reported outcomes and other things that are important to patients. This particular issue of uh, preventing progression is of great interest and you should be excited about it. We all are. But if that, I don't know if you can um, speak to that or not, if that would be part of the process that you would anticipate. Sure. We've, we've had two technical expert panels um, evaluating the measure so far. I cannot remember if we're doing another one. Um, but we've certainly been engaging the stakeholder community in our measure development process. Great. Thank you so very much. Um, so at this point, uh, we've gone through our three discussion questions. And you've heard from experts from HHS in different areas, and we appreciate not only their time, but it's not an easy time to be a public servant. And whether you are appointed or career, serving your country is a significant undertaking for both the individual and for the family. And so we appreciate your public service, each of you. Uh, Nick has served uh, in public service. I've served in public service, Richard Knight, our president, and Ed Hickey, our vice president. And it's a tremendous opportunity. But for the folks that you're listening to today, these are folks that directly impact kidney health and uh, they represent the United States government. Their views, they've been expressed individually uh, and the greatest ideas obviously attribute to the department, but you can tell from their words and from their time, uh, they're here to make a difference. We have some time uh, for a few questions that have come from our audience um, online. And I'd like to go ahead and throw over to Nick to ask the first of those questions. And I've got one or two here and we'll see how time goes. Go right ahead, Nick. All right. Um, what strategies are there for rural CKD patients to seek good monitoring and treatment programs? Uh, so one of the, I don't know, I don't know that I want to say positives to come out of the pandemic. Um, but one of the things that we're learning out of the public health emergency is that people like and will use telehealth. Um, telehealth uptake during the public health emergency has been significant, and I think it's, you know, making a significant difference for patients who, during the pandemic, could not go to the office because of healthcare risk, but also for patients in rural areas who might have to travel several hours to go to their physician office. And so I think the use of telehealth um, is a potential area for significant improvement for rural health care um, going forward. That depends on a number of factors, of course, including action by Congress and having sufficient internet everywhere um, for people to be able to engage in good video calls. Um, but I think telehealth is an area that we're really excited about. Uh, Dr. Gilaw, um, I think I want, to, I want to preface this question just by just for for greater understanding that uh, those that get kidney transplants 
can get a kidney transplant prior to crashing, right? Um, actually, the healthiest patients that are out there um, post-transplant are those that get really to the edge um, and transplant prior. Now, you know, we don't necessarily have enough kidneys at all in this country, and I think there's been an incredible amount of effort that's been put in um, by all the people in this room and others um, all over the country to try to improve and increase the amount of organs that are available, uh, particularly kidneys. Um, but, and this might be on the point, on the nose here, but you know, when, when are we gonna get there on this artificial kidney thing to the point where we can start getting to these patients and transplanting them artificially uh, prior to, especially if they're in a kidney shortage area? So I'd, I'd love to make a, a, a promise of a you know, specific date. Um, I can tell you that the, the stated goal of the, the Kidney X program uh, is to have an artificial kidney in human clinical trials in 2024. Um, I hope we get there. Uh, that, that goal was put in place uh, prior to uh, COVID-19 hitting us, so it may be delayed. Um, but the, the teams who are working to develop the, the technologies um, and, and move forward uh, continue with, with a, a good pace, and we continue to uh, help push that forward. Um, so that's, that's the short answer to the question. Um, I think the, the, the exciting uh, uh, part is that there are so many different technologies from a fully mechanical gizmo, uh, something that, that might be partially implanted and wearable um, to a, 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 a grown in a lab kidney that looks just like your own kidney and is re-implant. Um, all sorts of, uh, of different things at, uh, and technologies that are, are moving along. Um, of course, when you get into clinical trials, uh, speaking as an ex-FDA person, uh, there are no guarantees whatsoever. Uh, it's why we do clinical trials in the first place. Uh, um, you never know what, what might come up. Something looks good in the lab um, and on, on the bench top, and you run through all the tests, but once you put it into the complex thing that is a person, um, anything can happen. So we hope to get into trials in 2024. Um, and you know, depending on, on what timeline you're, you're looking at, um, you would look for commercialization uh, five to 10 years after that for like fully going on. That's back at the envelope entirely, conjecture. Yeah. discuss that later. Um, no, I remember reading through some of those submissions with you and, and Kristen and the team. Um, I'm just really excited about speaking of nerding out. Um, but one last question and before I turn it back to Paul. Um, and, and I think this is for you, Kate, um, as, as, you, as, you, well, as you obviously know, but CMMI has a three to five year trajectory in what's called the step one of, of testing, right? Or five years or... Well, you can explain better. Um, but you know, how do you how do you incorporate as you look into that um, treatments or programs that might have much longer term financial benefits than something that you might be able to measure, or is that a barrier right now um, in what CMI is able to to uh, measure against? Sure. I mean, there's a there's a two part thing, right? Like, what does CMS pay for, and then what is CMI going to get super excited about and pay for specially? Um, in terms of what CMS pays for, you know. The artificial kidney that I hope is coming because that's super cool and will solve a lot of well, solve a lot of problems, probably create new problems. Um, uh, you know, it'll follow the regular path for a new device, and I think CMS is optimistic that it will work and we'll be able to pay for it, and that'll be fantastic. Uh, in terms of what the innovation center then gets really excited about and does something special about, 
Um, one of the great things about um, cross-department collaboration is that we know that it's coming. Um, and so if there is an artificial kidney in the near term future and we know that Medicare is going to start paying for it, then we can be ready to go um, with incorporating it into our alternative payment models. Um, we already in our current models have general incentives for transplantation um, and we're always looking to more in that space since transplant is so important um, being the best treatment for most patients. So as soon as the artificial kidney shows up and is ready to go, we are happy to pay for it in a special and cool way. Um, that's no guarantee, of course. There's a lot of lawyers that have to get involved in the process before we can do that. Great. Uh, back to you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. And I tell you what, um, to give a little of a, a heat on the stove for the lawyers that might be in the pot, when that comes, on an optimistic note, uh, Dr. Eloff, you may uh, be pleased to know this, but patients around the globe are organizing as patient consumers to start developing the demand for uh, artificial organs, not only through the regulatory process, but also through, through the payment process. And we've had the pleasure at AAKP of working with groups since 2019 to organize an international and patient-led consortium uh, that will help encourage and work side by side with private sector industry and with government officials, but just as importantly, organize and raise the patient consumer voice all over the world, especially in those countries that don't have infrastructure um, or the technologies for uh, brick and mortar dialysis. This is where we think the huge promises uh, for patients, not only in the United States, but around the world through artificial technologies. It won't be the solution for everyone, but for the people that uh, can benefit from it and the lives that can be saved, uh, we're certain that's the future. So. Uh, while the lawyers may take a look at things, uh, they should know that patient consumers will have a very organized and very loud voice at the table uh, when that comes to bear. And you folks won't have to uh, do all the heavy lifting on that at uh, CMS or at HHS. Um, uh, two uh, last quick, quick questions here that have come in. Uh, one, uh, could each uh, panelist, and, and Dr. Quagran, I'll throw you in this also if you'd like to comment, um, talk about what you perceive as barriers to uh, home dialysis uptake and whether or not you think that the COVID experience uh, in the kidney patient population will serve as a driver for increased home dialysis. So I'll, I'll start. We're, it was a, kind of a, a game of a standoff here, um, but I, I opened my mouth first. Um, I'm not going to talk about the incentives aspect. I'll, I'll leave that uh, to my colleagues here. Um, but really, the uh, uh, technological aspect of it. Um, I think home home dialysis has a, uh, a lot of promise, um, a, as we've seen, um, and the uh, uh, the ability to get someone out of out of the clinic. Um, and and you know reduce the travel time, the sitting around, all, all of the things uh, uh, associated with um, what dialysis currently looks like is uh, uh, critical. Um, it would also democratize uh, uh, dialysis and, and further democratize dialysis, especially in areas that don't have those brick and mortar. Um, uh, 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 dialysis centers. The challenges are, uh, um, you know, the, the access to clean water, the safety of the uh, uh, access sites, uh, keeping them clean. Um, all of those, uh, uh, you know, the education can can uh, the machines uh, be used by a a trained lay person um, and things like that. These are all solvable issues. Um, and it, it, part of, of what we looked at in the, in the first phases of, of Kidney X and the redesigned dialysis uh, uh, prizes, um, I think some of these challenges still, still exist, obviously. Uh, but we can we can definitely do more to in, increase the, the technological aspects um, and and create safe and effective uh, uh, devices that can be used not just at home 
in in the city down the street from your, your doctor, but also in those rural uh, uh, health settings and and with uh, uh, much better telemedicine care and, and, and so on. And, and picking up from the sort of technological point and the structural point, right, you need clean water to do dialysis and not everyone has access to clean water. Um, there are sort of two other things going on and once we get over to the payment side of the house, um, there are structural disincentives in the way that Medicare reimburses dialysis care that tend to put patients in the dialysis center. Um, we pay less money for to a nephrologist who manages a home dialysis patient than to a nephrologist that manages an in-center dialysis patient. Um, and so we are testing alternative ways to pay for home dialysis in our current innovation center models for patients on dialysis um, to see if either of those mechanisms that we're testing can remove that structural payment disincentive and therefore increase rates of home dialysis. Separate from payment, there's also one of today's themes, which is educating patients. A patient who starts dialysis in center stays in center and is very unlikely to dialyze at home. So getting patients, getting people who are about to begin dialysis educated about what is about to happen to them um, and how, what their choices are and helping them choose the most appropriate form of dialysis care for them, be that in center or home, um, or getting prepared for a kidney transplant um, is a thing that we're also focused on. Our models are testing some mechanisms around that, but again, it comes back to the nature of educating patients before they need dialysis while they're progressing through CKD about their course of treatment. Um, and then just to bring it back to the COVID point, um, I think for us, COVID the COVID public health emergency really emphasized one of the advantages of dialyzing at home, that you don't have to go to a dialysis facility three times a week with a lot of other patients who may have COVID or in the future when we're all vaccinated and COVID transmission is down, may have other infectious diseases that are a challenge for patients who are medically compromised in the way dialysis patients are. So home dialysis is not only a patient choice issue, it's also a patient safety issue. Um, so ensuring that not only are the machines safe, but that the benefits of the home dialysis are also taking over that you don't have to go to the dialysis center safety, right? Like it's really a nexus of patient safety in addition to patient choice, in addition to people with dialysis being able to sort of live a more normal life than they would in center hemodialysis. And Paul, maybe I'll just um, finish up, and this is something I'm passionate about, um, home therapies and uh, increasing patient choice and options for patient. And again, having trained in Canada, um, you know, it's home first. Um, transplant, you know, while you're waiting for a transplant, home first, and only if the patient chooses in center or for another reason can't do home, it was always home dialysis. So, you know, I think the Advancing American Kidney Health um, Executive Order really brought this front and center in this country before the pandemic. I think in the pandemic, everything you've said is absolutely right. Um, you know, and there are different options and innovations in home therapies now. So, you know, peritoneal dialysis, you have bags of fluid delivered, but there's the home issue. Do you have a large enough house? Is there, you know, home? Uh, so for patients, so similar to everything in kidney health and kidney disease, there are disparities in who has access or who gets choice of home dialysis. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we could do in this country to help innovate um, along this line as well. I think incentives clearly are important. ASN has a home dialysis task force and there will be changes coming to training the future generations of nephrologists because again, there needs to be catch up in this country, but also programs like home assist programs that exist in Europe and exist in Canada where 
It, it could be for a short period of time to give the caregivers respite or the patient respite or you know, a more prolonged home assist type of program so we can keep patients in their homes as opposed to having to travel to in center. So I think it's an exciting time and I, I think there's been a lot of advances since my time in the US um, because of all the things that uh, the government has done. Thank you very much, Dr. Quaggan. And uh, I'll ask one last quick brief question that I got texted here underway, which is interesting given the discussion that we've had today. Um, I was recently diagnosed uh, with diabetes and I watched my mother suffer from diabetes and she had kidney failure and was on dialysis. After watching this program today, can I really be optimistic about innovations that are there for me? Should I follow the same course? And I think maybe it would be helpful uh, to the patient that emailed that if you could each from your own perspectives, uh, give a thought on that. Thank you. Yes. I'm the Pollyanna of uh, innovation. Uh, I, I like to think of, at least I like to think of myself that way. Um, one of one of my mentors uh, and and close collaborators in our kidney innovation and kidney X uh, uh, partnership inside the agency so it keeps reminding uh, of the 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 tragically poor outcomes for uh, uh, people who enter uh, uh, dialysis and says. Yeah, if we're looking five, ten years out, that does nothing for the patient who starts on dialysis today. However, we are working, and we are working very hard to put everything we can uh, in uh, first identifying patients who are at risk of kidney disease, um, and when when people are are diagnosed uh, with with kidney disease or on the path to kidney disease, working to understand what are the best therapies for them and getting those therapies to them. Um, I think Dr. Quaggan mentioned in in her open re opening remarks there are some really bright spots here. There are new drugs, there are new therapies, there are new medical devices that have come out. There's new telemedicine that has really, really helped. Um, I know it's, we hate to say good things came out of the, the tragedy that's been the, the public health crisis, but the telemedicine is really, really a fantastic bright spot. So, um, As, as a human, it is, it is hard to deal with the blow of a new diagnosis. Um, and especially when, when you know what the, the various scenarios are over the past 50, 60 years. But there is a lot of optimism for the future. And I hope that the patients that like the person you, you mentioned uh, sees that we are working towards uh, developing those innovations and getting them in the hands of the patients who need them. Yeah, I guess the, the thing that I'll add or put a finer point on, um, we're in a really unique time and have been since the 2019 executive order in that there's so much focus on taking a an area of medicine that had been stagnant um, and really putting efforts and resources from all of the government and um, the private sector and nephrologists and dialysis companies and patient advocates to push in the same direction to keeping in mind this goal of improving care and outcomes for patients with kidney disease. Um, there are a ton of smart, creative, dedicated people. We are here today, but there's so many more people who work on our teams, who we collaborate with, 
um, in the government and outside of the government working on this issue. And while you know, we hear from patients that um, the, the prospect of dialysis is daunting and that the need for dialysis can be very isolating, um, you, you are not alone. There are a ton of us working on this, trying to make individual patients' lives, people who are experiencing dialysis care, to make their lives better um, and to present more options than one would have had traditionally. New artificial kidneys, home dialysis, delaying or preventing progression um, are all areas that we're focusing on so that the diagnosis of diabetes, the prognosis of CKD improves um, and we can really improve, improve the lives of Americans. And maybe I'll um, just finish up and say um, to this patient that, you know, absolutely times have changed since his mother was diagnosed with diabetes and developed kidney failure. And just as we've been talking about today, there are many, many new treatments available today that can slow and prevent progression of kidney disease. So I would just ask the patient to talk to their primary care uh, doctor and make sure their kidney function is tested, a simple blood test, simple urine test. And, um, you know, there are lots of resources also, and I know AAKP provides resources for patients, NKF provides resources for patients. Our ASN website on our Diabetic Kidney Disease Collaborative has also has uh, resources. So um, I would just say, uh, you know, reach out if you've got any questions at all, because they're definitely are things to do. And I'm very hopeful for this patient. And it's a completely new time than when I started medicine. But there's also a ton of things that are in your hands as well, right? Remember that once you hit this stage of life and once you hit this diagnosis, your diet really matters, right? And the amount of control that you have over that side of it, right, combined with these innovative actions and new treatments and models that are going to be there, you know, I, I will say that that does give me the same, the same hope there that, that, that you won't have to follow that path, but it's about researching and, and knowing uh, where you are, where you stand, and, and what you don't do to yourself to make anything worse as you're trying to slow it down with, through innovation, I think is, is got to be the, the, the number one thing that, that, to think about as, because as, I imagine that, you know, and I think we've, some of us have been there before, after you get a new diagnosis, it's not just what can I seek, but it's also what can I do, um, as, as I know that a diagnosis can make you feel a little less in control um, of your own life. And so that, just wanted to interject that in there as well. Thank you so much, Nick. And I tell you what, that's a great point uh, as a lead in as we close. If you're interested in the American Association of Kidney Patients and the role that we have in the larger kidney community and some of the efforts that we're trying to advance for education and greater access to treatment. And as Nick said, to understand your responsibilities as a patient who's been diagnosed and the unique role you play in determining your own health in addition to many of the uh, positive things that are happening come on to our website, aakp.org, and you can learn more. You've heard a couple of things today about access to new treatments. We have a very interesting program called Patient Voice, Patient Choice, which outlines some of the innovations that are taking place and some of the barriers and provides you with different tools where you can communicate with your elected leaders and the federal government, CMS, and other agencies. The other thing is, uh, as citizens in the United States, we have a right to vote, and you heard today um, based on reflections on past experience of a very pra experienced practitioner on Capitol Hill, and as many of our leaders at AKP know quite well, uh, making certain that your elected leader knows that you are there and what you suffer from and what you're trying to do for other patients is very important. That's why we have uh, Kidney Voters, a unique voter registration program that's nonpartisan, where we encourage folks that uh, are champions of kidney patients and kidney innovation to sign up, register to vote, and make certain that your elected leaders, both locally and nationally, understand that you're an informed voter and this is one of the issues that you focus on. Um, if you want to learn more about other policy issues in the space and learn from other leading voices, uh, from large dialysis organizations, from UNOS and from others, on November 16th, the American Association of Kidney Patients will hold our annual policy meeting. It's the first policy meeting that will be held after the November elections. And we'll be using the findings of that uh, policy summit to inform our legislative agenda uh, for the next two years. But right now, what I'd like to do is thank uh, our sponsor, Bear. I'd like to thank Nick Yulecki, 
uh, my co-moderator, and again, uh, one of the just unsung heroes of the executive order in 2019 on advancing American kidney health. The number of hours he spent on that uh, is phenomenal and an open door for access for all uh, folks in the kidney community to raise their opinions. And he very dutifully sifted through those and had those included in the final product. And we're most appreciative of that. But to the team at the National Press Club, thank you. I'd also like to thank our National Strategic Communications Partner, Jonathan St. John, the owner of Briar Patch Media. I'd like to thank Jack Calabatinas from JK Communications, uh, who has also been of assistance to us. And I'd especially like to thank my fellow patients, Richard Knight, the president of the American Association of Kidney Patients, former Capitol Hill staff person, Edward Hickey, vice president and chair of the Veterans Health Initiative for the American Association of Kidney Patients, and a long time Hill and executive branch staffer, and the true unsung heroes of AAKP. Diana Kleins, our executive director, and Jennifer Rate, our director of communications. Without all of the assistance uh, of these fine people, today would not have been possible. Again, a special thank you to our uh, panelists, Dr. Quaggan uh, from ASN, uh, a very empathetic and uh, advanced thinker in kidney disease and a true champion for patients. And for our federal civil servants uh, who came today, uh, the entire panel, they took time out of their day. Uh, they deserve a great amount of praise, not only for the work they do in the kidney space, but for the fact that they serve America uh, with honor and with enthusiasm. So for all those who are watching, thank you very much for joining us today, both in the room at the National Press Club and online. Paul Conway, thank you.